Um, I'm sure all comrades have been following the events in Greece. Because although Greece is a small country, both in terms of population and in terms of its economy, at, the, at this moment in time, it's at the, it's at the center of the crisis of uh, the European Union. And also is having a global impact. Not just economically, but also politically. Many people on the left around the world have been looking to Greece. <coughs> looking with hope to Greece. Hoping that this new formation, relatively new political formation, Syriza, could offer an alternative to the endless austerity which people are suffering around the world. Uh, and we know what has happened, of course. From being a hope of change, the experience of the Cyprus government has confirmed once again that reformism has no answer to the crisis of capitalism. And we should use this in our, in our, in all our, in all the countries we're working in, as a concrete example of what happens when you try to apply a reformist program within the context of a capitalist system in crisis. In spite of the very radical program. They've not been able to apply any of it. Now, I'll come back to this later. But the situation in Greece is not just, as I said, not just an economic crisis, but a, a political problem for the bourgeois. <coughs> Different comrades have quoted this interview with Donald Tusk. in the Financial Times. And other, I'm not going to quote the whole thing, just one sentence. He says, I'm really afraid of this ideological or political contagion. <laughs> not financial contagion. Of this Greek crisis shows that from a financial point of view Greek debt is not a, is not a in, in and of itself it was if it was only the Greek debt it wouldn't be such a big problem but as you see he's He's concerned about the ideological and political. What he means by that is the impact of Greek politics on other European countries. I.e. that people and workers in other countries would want to copy the anti-austerity stance at least in the initial stages of the Cyprus government. And they have a warning in Spain with the rise of Podemos. Which has been always linked in the media. Podemos and Syriza. And what the, what the European bourgeois fear is a revolt of the workers across the whole of Europe. What 
What's happening in Britain is also a warning. And we can expect to see this in all the European countries in one way or another. Now, on a capitalist basis, the Tsipras government had two options. I mean, they, thought, they thought they had a third, which was um, a reasonable compromise whereby, okay, we don't get everything we, we promised, but we get some concessions. which would be seen by the masses as, well, they tried their best. They didn't get everything. But they did get something. That was what they thought was possible. But in reality, the two options were surrender to the Troika, apply austerity, and then take all the consequences politically from that. <laughs> Internal conflict inside Syriza. Disillusionment amongst the masses. A possible movement of the workers against the Syriza government. And remember... One of the first things the series of government when, when it did, did when it came to go, um, into office was to remove the barriers in front of the parliament. That was a symbolic gesture. What it showed was that government did not fear the people because the people were with the government. And that was a fact. If there were demonstrations in that period, they were in support of the government. I'm not sure if they put the barriers up again. I think they have. Because now the protest will be against. That was option number one. Surrender completely to the Troika. The other option, on a capitalist basis, would have been to exit the euro, possibly be ejected from the European Union, start to reintroduce the drachma, which would have, which would have faced a collapse in its value, a huge devaluation. It would have been, a, from an economic point of view, it would have been equally disastrous. The only real alternative was what the comrades in Greece call a socialist rupture. Ruptura. Um, I.e., you break with the Troika, you proceed to nationalize the banks and the monopolies, mobilize the whole of the working class, take over the factories, and appeal to the workers of Europe. Who can doubt that such a step would not have had a massive impact on the workers of Europe? The workers are looking to uh, Greece, in Spain, in Italy, in Portugal, in Britain. They call Corbyn the Syriza candidate. In Austria, there was an opinion poll. They asked the Austrians, would you vote for a party like Syriza if it existed in Austria? Twenty percent said yes. And the situation in Austria, however bad the Austrian comrades may think it is, is 
is far worse than Greece. And yet even in Austria, there's that feeling. Now, um, the crisis in Europe has, uh, the crisis in, in Greece is a reflection of the general crisis in Europe. Um, in June, there was an article that appeared in the Telegraph in Britain. And the headline was, The Eurozone Doomed Whether Greece Leaves or Stays. The underlying price of capitalism affects the whole of Europe. It's not just Greece. And what they're saying is, these are the serious analysts, what we need in the European Union is a general, is genuine, genuine integration of all the EU member states into one state. One state, one uh, fiscal system. Um, and it says that the choice is either integrate or disintegrate. And what they highlight is that um, they created the single currency in 1999. And this was supposed to be the beginning of an integration of the European economies. But they say that the countries using the euro have actually diverged more since 1999 rather than converge. And it says the Eurozone economies are now more divergent than at any time since 1982. And he says further, Greece is one example of how the situation in Europe is degenerating. No one should believe that Greece will be the only member country that struggles to remain in the Eurozone. And it refers to the persistent structural differences between Eurozone member countries. For some time, there's been talk of having a kind of two-tier Euro. An Euro. An Euro. La moneda. I.e. a Euro for Germany and its satellites, Finland, Austria, Holland, um, and another euro for uh, Italy, Spain, Portugal, Greece, etc. But you, you can't have such a thing as a two-tier euro. They would be two currencies. Therefore, it would be de facto a division of the European Union. So this 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 would be this would be basically the beginning of the end of the Euro of the European Union. Now this process is in in is taking place. And what's happening is that. The deepening economic crisis is bringing out all the weaknesses. And the weaker economies are being pushed further back relative to the strong. And 
when such a process begins, it's not going to stay put. It's going to continue. The stronger economies will benefit at the price of the weaker. Now let's look at the situation in Greece in terms of financial figures that we have. Greece's debt before this deal stood at 320 billion euros. <coughs> Roughly 180% of Greek GDP. Of this, they, they received 240 billion from the European uh, Union institutions, the IMF. And now they're asking for more, of course. The, the economic situation, GDP since 2010 has fallen by 25%. And Greek unemployment is about 26%. When Varoufakis <coughs> says that austerity doesn't work, it's abundantly clear if you look at Greece. At the beginning of the austerity, Greek debt was 125% of GDP. Now, in spite of all massive cuts, the debt has massively increased. That's a combination of two things. Having to borrow more to pay the interest, which is what they've just done, and the collapse of GDP. Because debt is always measured relative to GDP. And that's logical. You measure debt according to what you think the, the debtor can pay. That's why when you get a mortgage, usually what you get depends on your annual income. i.e. the bank thinks that you're in a position to pay. <coughs> the problem with Greece is it cannot pay. But the problem, the problem is it's not somebody buying a house. If somebody can't pay the mortgage, they can repossess the house. I was going to say, you can't repossess a country. But that's what the Germans are doing. They're repossessing Greece. Demanding they sell everything off. They've handed over control of the fiscal system to the Germans, as Geordi pointed out in another session. That's what's happening. Um, Syriza was elected not to do this, but it's doing, it's doing it. It even went into a referendum. Five days after the referendum, it accepted a deal which was even worse than the one that people voted on. Now, within the German bourgeois, the, the Finns also have this opinion. I don't think they count quite as much as the Germans. A significant section of the German bourgeois have understood that the Greek debt is unpayable. 
And to give another bailout is like throwing good money after bad. They've actually calculated that it would be cheaper to push Greece out of the euro and then intervene with humanitarian aid to, um, to save the Greek people from a disaster, i.e. feed them and a few other things. It's actually cheaper than a bailout. And a section of the German bourgeois has that opinion. The problem, of course, is the wider consequences of Greece leaving the euro. So, um, another section of the bourgeois and also countries like France and Italy. And Italy has a good reason for because it doesn't want to set a Greek precedent because Italy is in line for being treated like Greece. And of course, the problems for the European bourgeois is that if Italy enters a Greek scenario. Italy is not a small economy. It's not 2% of GDP. It is the third economy of the Eurozone after Germany and France. And its debt is somewhat bigger. Not in percentage terms, although Italy has a debt relative to GDP, which is already higher than what it was in Greece at the beginning of the crisis. <coughs> Italy has a public debt, I think, of something like 2 trillion euros. Now, if you give Italy the same medicine as Greece, and you basically increase Greek debt as a consequence by 50%, Italian debt, Italian debt. well, you can see that it's not just peanuts. And it would be basically the beginning of the end of the euro. So there are other pressures not to push Greece out of the euro. Obama put pressure on Merkel. Athens must stay in the euro. Why? The European Union is a major market. It's still one of the biggest markets in the world, as is the United States. Consumption is very high, obviously. Because of the state of the world economy, which is on the edge of a new slump, anything could tip the world economy over into crisis. So a crisis in Europe, a serious recession in Europe, would affect America. It would also affect China. The Chinese position, communist China, is that Greece must stay in the euro. It might be to do with the fact China owns important property in Greece. 
And Europe is also a big market for the Chinese. So you see the, the different contradictions in the situation, the opposing contradictions. But if we see if we see what this government has surrendered to VAT increases <coughs> hitting the poor directly the, the, the top rate of VAT was 23% era but it didn't apply for instance to food at a lower rate. Now they're applying the top rate to food. Um, taxes. Early retirement to, to end. The age of retirement to be taken up to 67. Something they said they would never touch. You see how Tsipras tried, that was one of the things he tried to resist to the very end on pensions. But the Germans uh, forced him to buckle on this. Laws to change the uh, um, labor rights. Attacking the workers directly. Privatizations. They're demanding electricity be privatized, the network. And in, thank, and, and in, and, um, in compensation, they would receive about 85 billion euros in a, a new bailout. This would take Greek public debt to um, over 200% of GDP. Making the situation even worse. Imagine just the interest you've got to pay on 200 billion. And then in the middle of all this, the IMF points out that all the negotiations are based on false premises. Saying that Greece will need a much bigger debt relief than we'd ever discussed. They're saying they'd have to give Greece a 30-year period of grace. And in fact, if you remember, when this, when this, when they got to a critical point, it began over a short-term repayment of something like 1.6 billion euros. But that was nothing. Because by the end of August, Greece needs to pay back in different forms over 17 billion euros. 17. And the more time goes on, the more debts have to be repaid. So it's an impossible position. Now before going back to Greece, I want to go a little bit back into the history of the European Union. Europe is where capitalism began. In Holland, in, in England, and then France, Germany. 
It was the heart of industrial development and capitalist development. Britain emerged as a, as a super, uh, world superpower. building a powerful empire. based on the most advanced industry. But nothing stands still. You have other rising capitalist powers, and particularly Germany, which once unified, promoted uh, industrial development, and it became a powerful industrial uh, a country, but it emerged at a time when most of the world had been carved up by other powers. The French had their empire, the Belgians, the Dutch, the Germans arrived a little bit late, they picked up a few colonies. I don't want to talk about the Italians. Some few embarrassing historical events for the Italian capitalists. But this emerging power of Germany, this emerging power of Germany, meant that the German industry required a, a wider market. That explains the two world wars, fundamentally. It wasn't just Germany and Britain, but they were the two key um, powers in conflict. They tell us that the wars were fought over democracy or to save Poland or Serbia or whatever it was. Democracy. These are not the reasons why the bourgeois go to war. They always go to war over markets, influence, prestige, privileges. Now, at the same time, when the Second World War ends, and we can ask the question also, who won the Second World War? When I was a little boy, that was a contentious question. I went to school in England and in the 60s. And it was always, we won the war. But if you look at it from an economic point of view, Britain didn't win the war. Germany won the war. Japan also lost the war militarily, but it won the war economically. Um, Germany emerges after the Second World War as a strong uh, power. But relative to the world economy, with the rise of America, Think of it, America at the end of the Second World War produced 50% of world GDP. Imagine that. The, America produced half of everything produced in the world. So you have the, the, the domination of US imperialism. You have the rise of Japan. And the whole of Europe, in reality, is, um, relative to the world, is reduced in its power and influence. A new world equilibrium emerged. Now, in this condition, 
every single uh, major European country. Could not resist the pressures of the world market on their own. Another element which I don't want to develop. The Soviet Union taking half of Europe. The Americans had to step in and save Europe. Through the Marshall Plan. Get them back on their feet. And basically preserve capitalism. i.e. preserve markets. Now initially, when the European Union was formed, I think it was born, formed the same year I was born. So we're all showing symptoms of aging here. <laughs> it was in the 50s. And initially it was just six countries. Germany, France, Italy, and the Benelux countries, Holland, Belgium, and Luxembourg. On the back of the boom, growth within the what was then called the European Economic Community or what they used to call it as well, the common market, which is what it was. They had significant levels of growth. Because they they partially begun to overcome the national limitations of capitalism. The national market of each country was not enough. What, the, what the, uh, the, the, the common market did is it opened up a wider market. That, com that common market gradually, if you look at what happened, gradually brought within its sphere the whole of Western Europe. With the collapse of the Soviet Union, it even, it even took in... Uh, uh, sections of the old Eastern Bloc. What Germany achieved through this was what it failed to do in two world wars. Its aim was the domination of Europe. It achieved this in the post-war period through the creation of a common market and then the European Union. It, it began a process of integration of the European economies. And it became, it became kind of defense of all these small European economies in the face of the United States, of Japan. But what is the European Union? On the left, we have some who talk about a democratic Europe, a social Europe. They, look, they, they indicate some of the laws they passed. And the reformists have the illusion that it's possible to reform the European Union into a genuine social Europe of the peoples. But they ignore the essence of the European Union. It is the domination, first and foremost, of finance capital and industrial capital. 
And remember how the euro, the euro itself was formed. It was formed on the basis of the Maastricht Treaty. What did that treaty say? No country was allowed to have a debt, a public debt, greater than 60% of GDP. Well, if we had to expel from the European Union those countries that don't respect that, there'd be nobody left. I don't know who would do the expelling. Huh? Oh, Luxembourg would be left. I suppose Luxembourg could expel all the others. <laughs> And the other criteria was that the, um, the budget deficit, the annual deficit, was not to be more than 3% of GDP. Now, some countries have managed to achieve that. But at the price of massive cuts, the problem they have, however, is even when they have a balanced budget, then they have to pay the interest on the accumulated debt. So in spite of all the massive cuts, the debt continues to increase. Because, because of the very size of the debt itself. And the interest. Now, the Germans were one of the main proponents of the euro. The United States also had some interest in a stable European Union. The European Union is a massive customs union, you could say. Um, to protect the European market. It defends European industry and European agriculture against African products, Asian products. But then they make bilateral deals with certain blocks. And for instance, there's bilateral agreements between the European Union and the United States. Now, within the, U the European Union, the imposition of the euro meant putting an end to the previous situation. Before, if Spain or Italy or Greece had some economic difficulties, were finding it difficult to export, they would devalue the currency. So that their goods would be cheaper, say, when they sold them in Germany. They could, actually, they could actually lower the prices in Germany. They could lower. But get the same number of liras, or even more liras, back. As you can imagine, the German capitalists were not too happy with that. Here we are, we've invested in uh, productive capacity. Advanced technology. A modern, efficient economy. And then these southern Europeans cheat by devaluing. <coughs> the Germans, this has got to end. Imposing the euro meant the Italians can't devalue, the Greeks can't devalue, the Spanish. 
what it did, it brought out the real weaknesses. Of the economies of Italy, Greece, Spain. Now, German industry is one of the most advanced in the world. As well as other countries like Austria, Switzerland, which is not part of the European Union. But Germany is an industrial powerhouse. The collapse of the Soviet Union also has an impact on the European Union. It allowed German reunification, which, which further shifted the balance towards Germany. It became a more powerful economy within the European Union. This had a consequence, for instance, in its relationship with France. France tried to maintain desperately the German-French axis. I.e. that France would play a leading role in the European Union. The problem was it wanted to do that at a diplomatic level, but it didn't have the money to back up that position. You know, we always say, he who um, pays the, pipe, the, the piper decides the tune. The French kept telling the Germans what tune to play. And the Germans said, no, no, we decide because we paid the piper. And you see in the recent period, France, from being at the center of the European Union, dictating the law to the others together with the Germans. But you know, everybody, you know in the playground at school, you always have a bully. He's usually bigger than the others. Stronger, and, and he usually has a mate who's not so big, but he feels strong because he's next to the big guy. And that was the relationship of France to Germany. Now, the bully's got bigger, and he looks down at his French mate. And he's giving him a kick in the bum. I don't need you anymore. And the French, ex-friend of the bully, has now suddenly found that he likes the French and the, Ita the Italians and the Spanish. Maybe that'll put an end to the anti-Italian jokes in France. Jerome says that's not possible. Eh? But the relationship has changed. Germany has emerged as a as the power at the heart of Europe. In the recent period, what has the German bourgeoisie done? There's been since 2000 or even earlier. There's been a massive increase in productivity of German industry. Which is a, co a combination of two elements. One of these is very rarely sp talked about. The other day I think Maria Clara spoke about it. What they have done to the German workers... There's a lot of talk about what they've done to the Greek workers. But 
earlier, they massively clamped down on the German working class. A whole series of labor laws, temporary contracts, <coughs> low wage jobs. I saw a documentary about there's this, there's this massive internal migration within the European Union taking place. Tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of Italians have left Italy. Going to Germany, to Britain, and other northern European countries. And they showed an Italian family Young, husband and wife with kids. The husband and wife left their kids with their grandparents. Went to Germany with 3,000 euros in their pockets. Slept in a container for a period. And eventually got jobs. And with that social housing... He was doing, I think, building work. And he was getting about 1,200, 1,400 euros a month. And the wife was on something like 1,000 or 1,200 euros. These are the kind of wages in Germany of a significant section of the working class. But the other, the other element was they invested in developing their industry further. The combination of cutting back on real wages and, investment, and massive investments in, in, in uh, technology increased overall productivity over a 10-year period by about 25%. And this creates a situation where now, if you look at Greece, and you look at Germany, and you look at the key element, productivity of labor in the two countries, German productivity is more than 30% higher than it is in Greece. Germany, therefore, is more competitive. Lower wages and high product, higher uh, technology. This has further enhanced the divergence within the European Union. It strengthened German capitalism within the European Union. In the past, there was a lot of talk about industry being old-fashioned. What we have to develop is services, banking and other services. Germany is the country, the of the major countries in Europe, is the country whose uh, industrial production as a percentage of overall GDP is one of the highest. China is another country that has that. It's even bigger than, than Germany. What it confirms is what we've always said. In the last analysis, industrial power is, the, is what defines re the real power. And Germany is definitely a power. 
But having created such a, an, a massively increased productive capacity, Germany needs to export. It exports more than 50% of its GDP. Um, therefore, it needs a wider market. Germany, in fact, needs the European Union. It cannot afford to have the union broken up into its component parts. That's why the Greek crisis poses such a huge dilemma. If it was only Greece that was removed, it would be a very small part of the market. But if it sets in motion a bigger process, which leads to Portugal, Spain, Italy, then that would be a huge part of its market that would be affected. <coughs> Germany also exports outside the European Union, of course. For instance, after the 2009 crisis, Germany uh, had significant recovery. 5% growth at one point. A large part of that was due to the fact that in that period, I think it, some, it doubled its exports to China. Particularly in advanced technology. Now, um, if we put this in the context of the last 30 years, we see all over Europe an offensive against the working class. Everywhere, low-wage jobs. As a consequence, this obviously puts a limit on the market. In that context, we saw the explosion of credit. And this was across the whole of Europe. Everywhere you went, Credit was easy. Even in Greece. Not so long ago, Greece was a pretty nice place to live. It still is. Because the sun is free. And the Mediterranean is in the Mediterranean. And olives and wine need a certain climate. That's not enough. Jobs. Development of industry. Exports. Greece is lacking in that. Because of its relationship within the European Union. But what was the relationship between Germany and Greece in the past? On the one hand, Greek export, uh, German exports were destroying industry in Italy, in Spain, in Greece, because the German goods were much more competitive. But how do you get these peoples on such low wages to buy your German goods? You lend them money. German banks... French banks mainly, the two countries, lend a lot of money to the Greeks. The Greeks spend it. They buy German goods. German cars, German stereos. A bit of European aid as well. Again, mainly German and French money to the Greek state. Building projects, motorways, new airports. Hmm. 
And everybody's happy. The Germans are exporting, making a profit. The workers in Germany are a little less happy. <coughs> but at least they've got jobs. The Greeks are spending money. What's wrong? Of course, the problem is, it's all on credit. And as long as the Greeks were able to pay the interest, the German banks and the French banks were also happy. They're making money from money. That's what it is. Then, of course, something happens. Quantity produces a qualitative change. The mountain of debt reaches a point where it becomes unpayable. Then the Germans, and by the Germans, I mean the German capitalists. Hans says, I know, I know. <laughs> it's not Hans's fault. The German media suddenly discover that Greek people are lazy. They like to sit in tavernas, eating good food, or coffee bars, drinking reasonable coffee. I say reasonable because it's not Italian espresso. But the Italians are exporting a lot of coffee to Greece, so they're happy. Um, this, this, this impression is created in the media in Germany that the Greek crisis is due to lazy workers, corrupt politicians, people not paying the taxes, and basically bad management of the Greek economy. Of course, they point the finger at everyone. But who's to really blame? The German capitalists themselves. The German finance capital. And of course, they're stooges in Greece. And they're stooges in Greece. So in Germany, they whip up a campaign of uh, lazy southern Europeans. <coughs> as opposed to the efficient machine of Germany. But in Germany also, they're applying austerity. They're applying austerity. The workers of Germany have suffered. But what do they tell the German workers? It's not the fault of the um, German government. It's because we keep having to bail out these southern Europeans. You're working hard in Germany. And then this money has to go and save those lazy Greeks. And this brings me to something else. Um, within the European Union, this divergence I spoke about earlier is producing internal divisions in every single European country. Internal divisions. We see the emergence of parties like UKIP in Britain or the, the, the Northern League in Italy or um, what's it called in Germany? The Alternatives for Germany. Huh? FD. Okay. George, Hans tells me it's split now. But anyway, it's the phenomenon 
of nationalism and with it comes a tendency to protectionism economically and it's expressed politically in this emergence of these parties. So instead of moving to a greater integration, because the cap Euro European Union is a capitalist union, and those who are being made to pay for the crisis of the European Union are the workers of all European countries, this is destabilizing all of the European countries. expressing itself in, in political polarization to the left and to the right. In uh, Greece, we have the rise of Syriza, which is a consequence of this. On the extreme right, we have the rise of the Golden Dawn. At the same time, in Britain, we have UKIP, but we also have the SNP. Against austerity. And then the latest development of Corbyn in the Labour Party. In France we have the rise of Le Pen. We've had similar phenomena in, um, in Holland. There's a generalized increase in distrust of the European Union amongst the peoples of Europe. Um, wherever you go, when you talk to ordinary working class people, they say the European Union. What's it done for us? This euro. When they introduced the euro, there were some countries that were very keen. The Italians were very keen. Imagine, finally we have the same money as the Germans. We are European. Oh, by the way, the word European has a strange meaning these days. You know, if you live in Malta or in Greece, you're not so European. The closer you get to Germany, the more European you become. You know, we are part of Europe. We are Europeans. That's what it means. I don't know what they say about Georgia and uh, Armenia, but anyway. which I think are also part of Europe, but uh, they don't, I don't think they're European in that sense. But there's an anti-EU feeling developing. And this can express itself both to the left and to the right. Um, because, think about it, all the austerity that is imposed on working class people in Europe in the Eurozone, is done in the name of the Euro. We have to save the Euro. Otherwise, it would be a disaster. But it gets to the point where in Greece, when they ask people to vote in a referendum, which was about a specific deal, the German media, the capitalists, the politicians, they try to transform that referendum into a referendum about whether you want the euro and the European Union or not. And the people of Greece responded. You've all seen the interviews. They tell us that if we leave, it will be a disaster. Can it really be any worse than what we already have? 
That's the move that's beginning to develop. The problem is nobody's posing an alternative. That's the problem. But on, on the debt, I have figures here for the um, uh, the Troika loans given to Greece over a five-year period. Over 250 billion euros. Forty billion were used to pay interest, not to reduce debt. Eighty-one billion were paid to finance maturing debt obligations, i.e. to pay back people who had invested. Nearly 50 billion went to recapitalize the banks. Over these five years, less than 50 billion were used to, for debt reduction. But as you can see, because of the other elements, this small amount of debt reduction doesn't make up for the other, other elements and therefore the debt continues to rise. And when they say we have to save Greece and give them money, what the Germans are doing, the French, they're saving their own banks. The money goes to Greece in the epoch of digital um, the electronic banking, the money probably doesn't even go to Greece. It appears on somebody's computer in Athens, and then it disappears again and reappears on the German computer. But what you can see from this is they're literally sucking the blood out of people. The bailouts are not a means to um, helping the Greek people. It's helping their own banks. But in the process, inflating the Greek debt. And the same applies to Spain and other countries. There's no way out of this on a capitalist basis. They could try cancelling some of the debt. But remember, they already did that in Greece, partially. But the debt is so big that even with a haircut, It still remains so big that it keeps inflating. The only answer is to cancel the debt completely. And there's a problem. That money is owed to somebody. And it's one thing if Greece cancels the debt, which is bad enough, If Greece defaulted, according to the Royal Bank of Scotland, the financial losses for the Eurozone will be 227 billion euros. 227. They say that um, a debt restructuring would cost them 140 billion.
So the difference is 80 billion euros. That's something they can still manage. But if it went beyond that, I have here a study. It's by the Bertelsmann Foundation. Gütersloh Brüssel. Brussels. Yeah, the biggest neoliberal think tank. It says this. This is a couple of years ago. The title is Greece's Withdrawal from the Eurozone could cause global economic crisis. It says it, they calculated the possible declines in growth for Germany as well as for 42 of the most important industrial and emerging countries. And it goes through different scenarios. If Greece leaves, they talk about national insolvency and massive devaluation. <coughs> and an increase in unemployment. Sharp decline in domestic demand. And the 42 top, top economies would have to absorb losses to the value of 670 billion euros. 70 billion. They know that the exit of Greece would only be the beginning. So then they move one notch up. One step up. What would happen if Greece left and then Portugal left? This would mean the loss of 225 billion euros for Germany in the next five years. And they would have to write off something like 100 billion euros. Then they moved to Spain. This would provoke declines in growth in Germany. In the United States, it would mean a loss of growth of about 1.2 trillion euros. And in the 42 advanced countries, losses of 8 trillion euros. And then, if Italy left, after Portugal and Spain, Italy would have to secede from the Eurozone. <coughs> Germany would lose 1.7 trillion euros. Yeah. Yeah. This is over five years. They'd have to write off something like um, 450 billion euros. Billion. In this scenario, economic losses in Germany would be the equivalent of 21,000 euros per head. The effect it would have on Greece 
In Greece, people would lose 15,000 euros per head. In Portugal and Italy, 17,000 euros per head. And Spain, over 20,000. And then it says, the scenario would eventually lead to severe international recession and global economic crisis. And then another commentator says, this is the business insider, and they quote somebody from the um, Saxo Bank, um, who says, historically, historic, no, historical precedents show that it is nearly impossible to keep a monetary union intact once the process of disintegration has started. That explains why Schobler, in spite of his conviction, the Greek should be pushed out. Greece should be pushed out. I'm sure some experts must have sat down and said, look, you have some good arguments, but look at this scenario. And they pulled back. What they did is they massively increased the pressure on the Greek government. And think of, what, think of the way they negotiated. If there's any trade union comrades here, you know that in a normal negotiation with the boss, you say, we want 5%. He says, oh, I can't afford it, can't afford it. Markets are bad, you know, times are bad. You insist, he offers 1%. No, we're on a strike. After the strike, you get 2 or 3%. That's a reasonable compromise. But imagine a negotiation where you go to the boss and you say, not 5%, you say, I want 1%. Because I know you have difficulty. And the boss says, no. You must take a cut. A 5%. He says, no, no, no. I'm going to consult my workers. Right, do you accept the 5% cut? And the workers say, no, 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 no. And then you go back to the boss. My worker said no. And the boss says, really? Well, in that case, I'm going to cut your wages by 10%. And you say, well, there's nothing else we can do. <laughs> and you go back to the workers and you say, well, we did our best. That is the equivalent of the last six months of the relationship between Greece and Germany. And Schobler, he grabbed Cyprus by a part of his anatomy which shall remain nameless. And squeezed very, very hard. And Cyprus said, okay. <laughs> And accepted everything. The problem with Greece is this. As I said, part of the whole, it's not just the economic question. Which actually is the least of the issues involved in here. It's because half of Europe or more is in a very similar situation to Greece. 
And therefore, to give concessions, even the slightest concession, would send a signal to the peoples of Europe you vote for an anti-austerity party and you will get some alleviation from this terrible suffering of the last few years. That explains why Podemos is strong in Spain. It explains the SNP. And in the, in the next period, we, will, we can expect similar phenomena. either through new formations, which can either be of a, a left-wing type or a more populist type, a bit like Grillo in Italy, or even right-wing. But the general swing, as you can see, the, main, the bulk of it is to the left. The bourgeois are terrified. We make any concession to Greece and we'll have a European-wide explosion of struggles. So we must humiliate Greece. We must show to the peoples of Europe do not place any hopes in a party like Syriza. And they would have humiliated Greece whether it stayed in or whether it was pushed out. Inside, they bent the government to every demand they posed. Why did Cyprus bend buckle like that? Because he's absolutely terrified of a Grexit. They've given him these figures. Because you want to come out of the Euro. You want the drachma. Okay, go ahead. Hyperinflation. Oh, you'll be out of the European Union. We will limit your access to our market. Oh, and if you want to lend any money, uh, you owe us money in euros. And a lot of money. He would be faced in a, in, in a disastrous situation inside Greece. So, inside Greece, inside the European Union, they've sent a message. These so-called anti-austerity parties can achieve nothing. Pablo Iglesias is not too clever when he says, I support Cyprus. What message are you sending to the Spanish people? Or the secretary of the French Communist Party? You know, there's a saying that says this. It's better to be to shut up and let people think you're stupid than to speak and confirm that you're stupid. The secretary of the French Communist Party could have kept quiet. Instead, he publicly congratulates Cyprus for having saved Greece and kept it in the Euro. Yeah, and defeated the German... Yeah, defeated the Germans. Yeah, the coup d'etat the Germans were organizing. Outside, they would have said, you see what a disaster... When a left government uh, runs things. 
And this is what the bourgeois were doing in Greece. They were sending a message to the workers of Europe. But this is not the end of the story. It's now destabilizing Greece. The political system in Greece is fragmenting even more. There is not one single Greek bourgeois politician that could replace Tsipras at this moment in time. None of the bourgeois parties can muster enough support to govern the country. So the intelligent bourgeois have decided they, they will use Tsipras. They are governing Greece through Tsipras. Because they know his limits. The bourgeois know the reformists. And they bent Tsipras to, to their will. And what are they doing now? Well, I have an article here from Katemirin, Ekaterin, one of the most serious bourgeois papers in Greece. This was in March. March. The title was, you know, there's a lot of talk about rupture. Socialist rupture. Some, some people in Greece talk about a socialist rupture. I think they're called communist tendency of Syriza. But the title, when it says Cyprus needs rupture with far left. And the, type, and the article starts like this. Does Alexis Tsipras, the Greek Prime Minister, have the guts to break with his far-left faction? The country's fate, fate, hangs on the answer to this question. The advice they gave him was he has to get rid of the left. How to do that? Call early elections. Remove all the left MPs. Then you have a right-wing Syriza. And then you can get on with the serious business. This is what Cyprus is doing now. A few months later, he's doing what the bourgeois are telling him to do. The Greek comrades will come in. But there's a rift, the left right lift, uh, split taking place in Syriza. In Syriza, what was the effect of this deal? There was a revolt of the whole party. The majority of the Central Committee voted against. Signed a statement, sorry, because there was no meeting. But they came out against. The youth wing of the party against. Piraeus region, against. All over the country. The supporters of Tsipras are a small minority. This led the bourgeois to even advise Tsipras to break with Syriza and launch a new party. With the idea of a Tsipras led party to form a coalition with other 
with, 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 bourgeois, with the bourgeois parties. Parties like um, Passoc, Small Passoc, Tokotami, the, the River. Some kind of some kind of bourgeois formation around Cyprus. But what do the left do? In a situation where the party is there for the taking. If, if Lafazanis had the guts and launched a battle, he could win the party easily. And it would be Tsipras who would have to leave. But you see, the nature of reformism, including left reformism, is they fear having to govern in such a situation. Lafazanis does not have an alternative. So can you imagine what he's thinking? I win the party. And then I'm in the place that Cyprus is. Oh, no, 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 no. That's terrifying. It's much easier to have a minority inside Syriza complaining and let Cyprus get on with the job. And then I don't take any responsibility. But he can't escape his responsibility. The ranks of Syriza want a fight. But Lafazani says, we are all united in our differences. Which means saying, we're not going to fight. He's now negotiating with Cyprus to organize a friendly divorce. Why? Because they do not want to awaken the masses below. If he's launched a serious battle, there would be a massive enthusiasm of the working class. But that's what he doesn't want. Because then he'd be under pressure. And so the move that's developing is Lafazanis is not prepared to fight. And many good activists are leaving the party already now. Then we have our friends from Koe, the, uh, these lefts, 17 members on the Central Committee, who resign. What a coincidence. By resigning, there's no longer a majority of the CC who signed that statement. The comrades could give the details. But apparently it seems that Cyprus has said, you resign from the CC, and you can keep your four MPs. Make a nice little deal. Basically, the battle for Syriza is being lost because of the left reformists. And we may be facing a split of Syriza by September already. You see here the potential for revolution. And it's being thrown away. First by Tsipras, <coughs> then by Lafazanis. And this is going to lead to a, a fragmentation of the left in Greece. And Tsipras is going to maneuver to keep Syriza, keep the name, and with his per person, and he will still maintain a certain level of popularity. 
go to the elections without the left and prepare to carry out your story. I have a lot more I'd like to say, but I will leave it there for a minute. 